it's interesting what's happening, but it's not great for USCC, right? We don't want liquidity fragmentation. We don't want developer and user confusion. So how, how can we tackle that? Welcome back to another episode of Zero X Research. We have a great interview today with Zhao Reginato from Circle discussing all things CCTP. Uh, so, of course, this episode was recorded prior to the meltdown we've seen uh, of what have been the last three days. Uh, but we have, we're joined today by Zero X Pibbles and Effort Capital to kind of discuss uh, what exactly that meltdown was, what triggered it, what were the implications for uh, the broader economy as well as the crypto industry itself. Uh, and there were some interesting aftershocks that really rippled through uh, DeFi as a whole that we can you know, have the ability to view on chain and uh, really dive into what exactly happened. Um, but like I said, the uh, the interview itself was recorded to prior to this this whole event. Um, but we are recording this on Monday, March 13th. Uh, so we've got a pretty good picture of what happened. Uh, Sam, why don't I throw things over to you to kind of give us a breakdown uh, of what the last 72 hours have really contained? Yeah, it's been a crazy last uh, three days. I didn't get to enjoy my weekend as much as I would have liked to. But we saw basically the three largest banking partners uh, from the U.S. Uh, for crypto companies go kaboom. So that's unfortunate. Basically, Signature went out last week or the week before. And then Friday, it was announced that Silicon Valley Bank was going to close, which is a huge bank for all things VC, tech, startup industry. Uh, and we saw all the, uh, the big names like Bill Ackman and, and many others kind of advocating for a bailout. And then Sunday, what do you know? The Fed came out. They announced that Signature would also be closing, which was the final crypto bank. Um, and they would also be standing up a facility called the Bank Term Funding Program, where banks can lend their assets at par value at pretty favorable terms if they are met with a liquidity crunch due to a bank run. So that really eased uh, worries around USDC and the $3.3 billion they had parked at Silicon Valley Bank because they knew that everyone would be made 100, 100% full. Sorry. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of interesting ramifications. I'm sure everyone's heard about it a ton. Uh, so we're going to do a little hot seat, cool throne with just a rapid fire list of items that we have here because there's a lot of them this week. I guess we can start with uh, USDT buyers. Would you guys throw them in the hot seat or the cool throne? They're easily on the hot seat. Um, so like Sam, like, like you mentioned, at one point, USDC was down as much as 89 cents. I actually think I saw in Binance US. It went as low as like 35 cents on like a scam wick to the downside. Uh, it was absolutely mass panic and people were just flocking to uh, what they felt were the safest assets at the time, which is funny because we don't even understand USDT's or Tether's counterparty risk. But at that moment, everyone knew that Tether was the flock to safety. USDC was at least partially unbacked. Uh, and on chain and even on centralized exchanges, people were buying USDT at a 20% premium to USDC. And we're paying somewhere on the order of magnitude, like a dollar three, a dollar four, uh, during like the peak euphoria or, or fear uh, during the market. Yeah, I think I would caveat this with it depends when you became a USDT buyer, right? So uh, for those that capitulated at that 86, 87, 88 cent range, uh, flipping their USDC, yeah, that's 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 a hot seat. There's no doubt about it, um, especially because you know the redeemable value. Uh, let's assume the lot, circle lost that 3.3 billion. Uh, that's about seven and a half percent or eight percent of their total uh, USDC reserves. So you know an eight percent haircut would mean you're still redeeming for 92 cents on the dollar, presumably. So that really just goes to show uh, with that wick down, you know, sub sub 89 cents. Uh, it really goes to show that this was a truly a, a panic fueled crisis, um, and also goes to show the so shortages, some shortages of on chain liquidity. Right, like uh, Uniswap, you know, the largest dex by volume. Uh, the Uni V three ranges got blown out, right? Because all of these stable swap pairs on Uniswap, uh, they get these very very tight tick ranges, which maximizes the the amount of liquidity um, for stable times. But when things get blown out, you know, sure there could have been twenty million dollars in this Uni V three pool. Uh, but a very small percentage of that was actually in range when when asset prices really blew, blew out. Um, so, you know, that and if you look at the curve pool, the deepest source of on-chain liquidity for USDT and USDC, uh, we see that really there was a crazy, crazy mismatch of, of tokens in that pool, right? So there's three different assets all pegged to a dollar. Uh, so ideally, in perfect balance, you have 33% of each asset in the pool. Uh, well, USDT's uh, balance got as low as 1.4%. And the 
balance of USDC in the pool got as high as 90% of the assets. So you really just see everyone was in a mad dash to dump USDC. Um, and, you know, we, we're, we're looking at it today. Uh, we're looking pretty close to repegged. I think last I checked, we were like 99.5. Um, so, yeah, if you if you were an unfortunate seller of USDC uh, in that lower 90 range, then you know, you're, you're in the hot seat this week. Curve is another one you could throw on the the cool throne here because I mean, geez, that volume, what was it? 6.4 billion. I think it doubled the the next closest high on daily volume. So they were definitely raking in the fees. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, I've actually got this pulled up in front of me. I'm writing a quick flash note here on, on all the things we saw that happened on chain. Um, and since Friday, the three pool has seen over $8.3 billion of volume. Uh, and the USDC USDT pairs on Uniswap, uh, which is two pools on two different fee tiers, have seen 6.4 billion. So um, two two more billion dollars of, of Curve three pool volume, and that's just churning out fees. So uh, V Curve lockers, another one in the cool seat this week. Yeah, I'd say another big hot seat was definitely any DeFi protocol that denominated debt in USDC, which was way too many. Like you take this further to even DYDX. Like people were in a rush to withdraw from DYDX because it's like, all right, what does it matter if I'm trading, you know, freaking toy coins when I'm going to pull off this USDC and it's not going to be worth anything. Uh, it kind of points back to that paper that Arthur Hayes dropped uh, maybe a week ago about the Nakamoto dollar when he was proposing a delta neutral Bitcoin backed stable coin that obviously wouldn't scale right now with what we have. That this kind of takes me back to the Terra situation. It's like, man, what they were building was such a cool idea, like actually a decentralized stablecoin, but it's time just wasn't ready and it probably won't be for the foreseeable future. But uh, you could even throw like Dow treasuries in the hot seat this week because I know I'm a, an investor in a lot of different Dows who hold a vast majority of their token holdings in USDC. So I was like, man, like if I own the equity of this you know, treasury and USDC is, is depegging, then that's directly affecting me. So I think it's a good... Uh, a good lesson to be learned by DeFi protocols to actually diversify their treasuries into um, ETH or whatever the native asset is in that chain and kind of put their money where their mouth is. And don't hard code USDC to be equal to a dollar because we saw a lot of DeFi protocols doing that. That's not kosher. Um, and another hot seat actually related just to explain like how much of a mass panic there was. Um, one address leveraged uh, KyberSwap, which is like a... Um, uh, an aggregator, a DEX aggregator, and they tried to swap $2 million worth of three curve, uh, you know, the LP position that represents the, um, you know, that, that person's ownership of the, of the three pool, $2 million worth of three, uh, worth of three curve through Kyra swap. They ended up getting five cents of USDT. They went from $2 million to five cents. They got MEV that badly in mass panic. So um, I saw there was a, a tweet from the Kyber team uh, regarding like how the situation unfolded. But just to kind of that person had a really bad Friday night. You hate to see that one. But I guess that one is a perfect segue into another another cool throne, which would be anybody in that's involved with ETH staking. So they're a validator. If you're an LSD token holder, you printed the the actual numbers are pretty insane. So there was five thousand, a little over five thousand ETH of MEV distributed to stakers, which absolutely shatters the the next recent high. I think it was somewhere in around one and a half, two thousand uh, ETH. And now, if you look at the value of cash flow flowing to ETH stakers, so um, burn uh, le- the burn, the priority fees, um, and the MEV. That's actually flowing. If you look at quarter over quarter, so Q4 of last year compared to the expected values of Q1 this year, uh, we're looking at an ex- expected value of an increase in 36% in ETH terms and 61% in USD value. So much of that's driven by the ETH burn itself. Just the uptick in volume has led to more ETH being burned. And of course, that flows to all t- ETH token holders, including stakers. Uh, but a lot of that is indeed driven by MEV. So uh, we've really seen this uptick in on-chain activity. Uh, really drive more value to uh, to some some of these ecosystem participants. And uh, that really flows in with the curve thing as well, right? Like if you are a protocol that has the ability to turn like FUD and panic into fees and revenue, uh, you're sitting in a good place in this industry because there is plenty of FUD to go around. Yeah, definitely another winner there along with curve with synthetics and Quanta. They topped out their 
their 24 hour volume exceeded 100 million, which uh, kind of explains why synthetics rallied so heavily yesterday. But it's a great look. You love to see it, especially when you have people like Andrew Kang getting liquidated and just wrecking GMX. How do you guys think uh, Coinbase plays into this? I, I'd actually take the contrarian take. We've been gassing up Coinbase a lot the few, last few weeks, so I've got to got to bash on them a little bit. But why tweet out on a, like 11.30 p.m. on a Friday night that USDC to USD conversions are no longer supported until Monday? Like that, I think that's kind of what started it all because, you know, we saw the three pool getting imbalanced throughout the day on Friday, but USDC didn't actually DPEG until midnight on uh, Friday night, I believe. So I don't know. I was shocked that they would do it that way. I think it, it was really around the concern, not just with uh, with Silicon Valley, but at that time, Signature was still operational, we, we think. We don't really know because they got shut down on Sunday officially, but we didn't really know the status of their financial well-being Friday night going into Saturday. And they were really the only um, operation that could do 24-7 off-bank hours, mint and redemptions in partnership with Circle. Um, so I'm sure it had to do with something with Signature and just, you know, out of, out of a cause of concern, not swapping USDC for $1 because... Again, we didn't really know how much of the contagion was going to spread uh, come Monday morning. And I think everyone was really just on edge waiting to see what the federal government was going to do on Sunday. Yeah, I know they have that new banking partner, too. I think it's called Cross River Bank, and they're looking to do automated settlement for minting and redeeming of USDC. Um, David, I think you mentioned earlier that that would be 24 um, seven. But I, I haven't read that anywhere. Do you know for sure if that's going to be around the clock 365? No, honestly, that that's an assumption by me, uh, just because I'd have to imagine, I think we were talking about it internally um, on one of our morning chats uh, about a week ago, but it, it kind of, ha- it doesn't necessarily have to be a 24 um, seven redemption system, but I'd have to imagine off bank hours uh, from five to nine uh, Eastern Standard Time. If you're a market maker or if you're a user holding USDC and you can't redeem at a dollar in in you know in the liquidity crunch event or liquidity need event, um, what do you do? Uh, does USDC depeg now, uh, even partially, just for having that inventory risk from f- from five to nine off bank hours, or even on a bank holiday like on Christmas Day? Is USDC going to start depegging just because there's no 24-7 system? So I think Circle knows and understands the need for this kind of payment to always on system, you know, to, to work in parallel with, with crypto being a 24-7 marketplace. So um, that's that's my assumption that, that it is 24-7, but uh, no official word on that yet. Does anyone have an opinion on Maker? Like they seem like, you know, the dye supply actually grew over the the weekend and I, I that's still beyond me if anyone understands why that happened please tell me because i don't get it but regardless um they've got a lot more uh die slash usdc uh reserves to deploy as um uh, treasury bills so I'm, I'm curious what you guys think there yeah i can partially like my understanding and i didn't really even think about this but in the need in, in a, a crisis event like this a lot of people like to joke that die just wrapped usdc and while that's partially, that is relatively true. I mean, at that time when the DPEG event occurred, Dai was only backed, I believe, 50, 55 percent USDC, and the other backing was through non-USDC, right? Ethereum, or sorry, ETH, uh, state wrapped state ETH, um, real world assets, right? So like, it is partially wrapped USDC, but I think in a flight to safety event, and you couldn't really get. Uh, sizable volume and tether because of how much liquidity was drained from the curve pool. Um, Dai was like this next area for a flight to safety. Now, with that being said, Dai depegged just as much as as USDC did because I think the market still aligns Dai with just being 100% backed by USDC, which is not the case. But um, in this event, I think people just flock to Dai as this potential area of um, of safety. And you know, to your point. The dye supply grew 20, 30% over the weekend. And now what Maker can do is take this USDC that's on their PSM and then leverage their partnerships with Coinbase and which uh, Money Tales Clydesdale, like some of these uh, real world asset originators, and then take that, I don't know, I think it was like $2 billion worth of dye. I'm sorry, worth of USDC. Uh, take that $2 billion worth of USDC and actually invest that into yield. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, into T-bills to generate yield for die holders. So 
Maker, like even though there's a lot of FUD going around at the at, in the moment, they were actually a big winner in this and growing their PSM, gr expanding to the dye supply, and ultimately going to be able to create like yield generating opportunities for their holders. Um, so big winner. Yeah, I would agree with that. That they they're a winner here, and I think Frax also applies to this next statement as well. In that, like I th we learned today that. The Frax and Dai aren't pegged to the U.S. dollar; they're pegged to USDC. Um, you know, we saw they both tanked pretty equally to, uh, in line with the, the price action of USDC. Um, and you know, if you have to like stop and ask yourself, like, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, and I, you know, ideally we do get those decentralized dollars, but today, like, that's just not something we have the ability to to generate. And Sam Kazimian has actually talked at length about this recently, and just that if you, like we need a fed master account enabling on chain dollars and like you know i'm personally not sold that that will be a decentralized protocol being the one doing that like surely that will the first participant in that will be usdc and like at then at that point then you do have like risk free dollars right those are almost equivalent to treasuries um, there's no intermediary bank risk that we've seen is an, in, is indeed an issue right like this is exactly what happened with S, svb um, and that i think will be uh, the big the big unlock at that point and like you know is that a cbdc is that not a cbdc is up for open debate but like to me like usdc really almost already is a, uh, a cbdc and like i don't necessarily think that's like a horrible thing no one's being forced to use usdc um and like yeah like it can already be blacklisted and if the government wants to blacklist you for, with usdc like they can and they will um so uh, I, I just like the optionality. And if you want like the most risk-free on-chain dollar, that will be a FedMaster account enabling an on-chain provider like Circle uh, creating this. So um, personally, I, I would be excited at that. Uh, I think it would remove another step of, of risk from the system. And you know, in a, in a perfect world, I think we get multiple uh, FedMaster accounts providing on-chain dollars to, again, even you know distribute that and promote competition amongst the providers. Yeah, 100% agree there. You can actually, kind of tailing off that, like another cool throw-in could be Caitlin Long. She's the founder of Custodia Bank. I highly recommend following her on Twitter because she's like a Wall Street veteran, knows way more about this stuff than probably all of us combined. Um, so she's like perfect for this. But she applied for a FedMaster account and just got denied like a week ago. So the timing is really convenient. It's like, why are you doing this? She's trying to start a crypto that uh, a crypto bank that kind of helps crypto companies that's always 108% collateralized by cash and cash equivalents in the form of T-bills. So this would be the perfect solution for us. And she's been working on this for like four or five years. And she finally got word back that no, it's, it's not happening. So I think I'm in line with you, Dan. I think we do need someone with a FedMaster account who can settle these things like as they should be, but I think we're a little ways away from it. Yeah, also agree there. What's everyone's take on the market cap change to USDC? It shed about three or so billion dollars um, worth of USDT or USDTC, sorry, uh, Circle's USDC stablecoin. Um, it kind of feels in line with what I would have expected. Like, you know, we got that late Sunday announcement that all deposits will be covered by the federal government. That kind of gave you that safety blanket. I think that really like slowed some of the, the rush to the exits. Like, okay, like what's the point of really going and battling this? Um, especially if you were like a large fund that held a significant amount of USDC, uh, you already have a vested interest in the space and you basically need USDC to, to continue advancing, um, you know, effort. And I were just talking about that before this call. And so, I don't know. Yeah. What's everyone's take on like, we lost 3 billion in market cap, like seem on par underreaction, overreaction. My take here would be had the fed not come out Sunday and, and done what they did that USDC's market cap would be between 20 and 30 billion right now. And that hole would have gone from seven and a half to 8% to what would that be? Like, 15 to 20%. I don't know. That's tough math on the spot, but you know what I'm saying? So I, and I think they would have done it. Like, I think they would have honored one-to-one -one redemptions to appear like everything's fine. When in reality, all of that cash was really kind of in the hands and, and uh, of the fed and the actions that they would take. So I think it could have been a lot worse and I'm still surprised today to not see more of a market cap retraction, but that, that's a really good sign for the, the, the hopes of people and belief in USDC moving forward.
doing mental math on a, on a live recording, like that's bold. I'll be honest, but, um, but yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And like, that was my expectation too, right? Uh, you know, we just published the USDC monitor dashboard live on Dune. You guys should all go check that out. We'll throw a link in the description to that. Uh, but you know, I was building that yesterday at like six o'clock. I was five hours in when we get this announcement and it, yeah, I was basically like, ah, oh, well, this definitely isn't going to be as useful as it would have been had people been rushing to the gates. But nonetheless, um, it, it does give you a great oversight of kind of uh, the liquidity and price action that we saw uh, throughout this 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 uh, event. You also got to think about like if there was a three point three billion dollar hole, let's assume every dollar that U.S. that circle had on Silicon Valley Bank was written off to zero. Obviously, that wasn't the case, but. There's also a lot of USDC on chain that is in protocols that that USDC is not moving like anytime soon. So prior to the die supply expanding over two, I think it was like 2.2 to 2.4 billion USDC were in makers PSM. So yes, there was a $3.3 billion hole, uh, you know, on, on circles balance sheet for a temporary time, but there also is like billion and that's just one uh, DeFi protocol. There's like billions of USDC like MakerDAO's PSM that probably was not going to come in and go to redeem, uh, you know, one for one for one at any time soon. So um, I think there's a lot of like locked USDC inherently in the DeFi ecosystem um, that really wasn't going to move just because it is not easy to to move that size anytime soon, especially by DeFi protocols that they can't just like redeem USDC one for one uh, without maybe some like governance process to, to do that. Yeah, I really want to know how much USDC is lost too. Like, it's got to be a pretty high number, realistically speaking. It's like you know, you always hear those stats about companies and why they sell gift cards still. It's like, why is this still a thing? Like, apparently they make a ton of money because there's always like a dollar and twenty five left, and it actually adds up to a significant amount. It's kind of like the same story there. Um, but onto another uh, hot seat or cool throw, and this one's pretty obvious. But what do you guys think about CZ Binance? I think it's interesting, um, specifically. I'm curious if there's further action coming from the government against Binance that he's looking to move this billion dollar fund out of stable coins. And uh, you have to wonder like if he's splitting that in Bitcoin, ETH and BNB, if he's buying that much BNB and a regulator is coming after Binance, then perhaps he's giving exit liquidity to early investors in Binance. So there's a lot of shady stuff going on. And uh, will be lots of fun to watch. It's sp- conspiracy, uh, conspiracy theory season. Then, um, I guess the other the other conspiracy theory is like this was part of like a coordinated attack uh, against crypto banks, right? Like the signature bank happened on a weekend, uh, late at night, when just kind of felt out of place. And you know, I'm not a I'm not a bank balance sheet expert, but my understanding is it had uh, didn't quite have the same level of risk as SVB did, and yet it still kind of got gotten brought down in the crosshairs of this all. Um, and I, yeah, I guess that would throw Nick Carter on the cool throne for calling this this madness out. Uh, gosh, that was probably like already two months ago. Uh, and he was all, really all over Operation Choke Point and as, you know, con- continually flagging things uh, related to, to the effort to kind of control or constrain the amount of capital flowing into this industry. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, to your point, Signature was not in great financial standing, really no regional bank was uh, heading into the weekend. Um, I think as of end of 2022 on their balance sheet, they had about $6 billion in cash and about $7 billion, 17, sorry, $17 billion worth of available for sale securities that they can liquidate in the event of a bank run. Um, So that in total, and that's obviously as end of year, but in total, they had about $23 billion in in available funds, technically that could liquidate uh, in in event of a cash, a bank run and they only supposedly saw $10 billion worth of withdrawals on Friday. So they technically should have had an additional $13 billion, give or take a billion, probably about $13 billion of liquidity left. Um, and CNBC announced a, a report uh, and commented, they got comments from Barney Frank, uh, who wrote Dodd Frank, one of the, like, the, the landmark bills of the 2008 financial crisis. And he's a board member of Signature. And he explicitly stated that. To their knowledge, heading into Saturday, Signature Bank was still in a decent enough standing to survive and that they were pretty much told on Sunday that they had to shut it down. Meanwhile, there's banks like First Republic. Uh, they were able to, I guess, get a liquidity injection from JP Morgan. 
uh, but they were not in good financial standing. And there's a handful of banks that are, you know, this morning uh, on the on the stock market that fell 50, 60 or 30 percent plus on the day just because of this this mass panic. Um, it really does not make sense for Signature to be the sole bank to be shut down in these events. And it's just really odd timing because the same like five, within the same five minute window that they announced this new federal program, they announced that Signature Bank was getting closed. Uh, they did not make like a big thing about it. So I'm not one for conspiracy theories of wearing a tinfoil hat, but this one feels a little shady. Yeah. And then you add to that, that all these funds based in the US, like a lot of them used Signature and now they have to go through the whole process of finding another bank and there's there's a good likelihood they won't get approved anywhere and then they have to go to offshore banks. So um, really terrible move by regulators and it's just... Uh, kind of pushing crypto further away yeah I, I buy the theory to be honest i don't think this whole entire situation was stirred up specifically just to get rid of crypto and make it harder in the us but i do think it was a convenient outcome i mean we had a fed official last week saying literally as silver bank was being or sorry silicon valley bank was being kind of like run on uh, say how much better off um, FDIC insured banks are when he didn't even realize at the time that he was speaking, like there was literally a bank run occurring. And then you also have like uh, members of Congress, like uh, Elizabeth Warren, like kind of like provoking these bank runs. Like it's just really weird. None of it adds up. Why did Signature get picked at all the banks? I'm definitely on the Nick Carter camp and throwing him in the cool throne for calling this one out well in advance. I do have one more cool throne and that's Y2K Finance on Arbitrum, the the exotic stablecoin peg market. I shouted this out in the newsletter a few weeks ago when all there was another wave of USDC FUD. But um, people who were deposited in the risk vault, like, I mean, if you deposited one Ethereum in the USDC DPEG vault, you just got paid out 50 Ethereum. And I think they had like four or five stablecoins DPEG this past weekend. so. People who were gambling on there got paid huge. Is there a way to use Y2K to bet on repegs or is it only DPEG insurance? Yeah, so there's a risk and a hedge fault and whichever is the opposite of the DPEG is you just like betting that it won't DPEG. Um, so I guess that's the closest thing to it. So what a lot of people will do is they'll like deposit into like USDC won't lose its peg this epoch. So they'll get paid out like 30% in Y2K tokens. And those Y2K tokens share fees when actual DPEG events do happen. Interesting, yeah. And isn't the uh, the range on that like pretty tight? Don't they like define a DPEG as 99 Yeah, it was like right? 9924 and they use Chainlink oracles. So like the moment that reads on a Chainlink oracle, uh, everyone's paid or rugged. I think that's a good uh, good spot to end it. Uh, I'm, we're, I'm really excited for you guys to listen to this interview because despite all the drama with Circle over the weekend, they are building one of the most uh, the, one of the most product market fit bridges that I've ever heard of, and you're going to hear all about it here. So here's our interview with Jao Reginato. I cannot recommend enough for you guys to all check out blockworksresearch.com. If you go over to the research tab and toggle free research, you're gonna get access to some of the best free reports in the industry. And if you want to subscribe to Blockworks Research, you can do so using 0x research 10 at checkout in order to receive $250 off. And you can also sign up to our free newsletter if you wanna just get a little taste where we give alpha on governance, degen trade ideas, market commentary, charts of the day, etc. Kind of get you caught up to speed on everything you need to know in the market within five, 10 minutes. Give us a follow at Blockworks Res, Blockworks R-E-S on Twitter. We'll release our new reports during the week. And even if you uh, don't have access to the reports, you're not a paid subscriber, you can still check out the topics we're writing about and get a, a little bit of a brief insight into what uh, the contents of the report is about. If you want to know a little bit more how we think on the data side of things, head over to our Dune public account. We have four dashboards live there for free. The revolution will not be quarterly reported, so definitely check those out and let's kick it over to the interview. All right, everyone, welcome to our interview with Zhao Reginato. He is the VP of Stablecoins over at Circle, uh, the creators of USDC. Uh, so thanks for joining us today, Zhao. I'd love to throw it over to you just to introduce yourself to the listeners uh, and maybe give you a little bit of background on the origin story of Circle and uh, how USDC fits into the, to the crypto landscape today. Sure. Thanks for having me, uh, Dan. Um, yeah, so I've, I've been with Circle for almost eight years at this stage. And so I have seen uh, you know, a lot of the 
a lot of the evolution as a company that we have had in terms of bringing products to customers and, and trying to deliver on on the the vision that we that we have and uh, and circle was was one of those companies founded you know 10 years ago in the early days of of uh, i think crypto emerging as an industry and the vision has been that you know how can we how can we bring this technology um, to to kind of transform the way that financial services uh, you know have been built over the years and and hopefully bring a lot more um, efficiency to the system and, and connect people around the world in ways that they haven't been connected, um, you know, financially and economically speaking. Then, and we have tried to do that in many different ways. I think for folks who have followed the the industry for a little longer, uh, Circle Circle originally was a was a consumer focused company, right? So back uh, back when I joined in 2015, actually we had a product called Circle Pay. It was a peer to peer payments product. Um, uh, it was it was a great kind of user experience that we had at the time. It allowed you to do simple things like buy and hold Bitcoin, but it the main focus was uh, peer to peer payments. So you know leveraging the Bitcoin uh, network to to kind of transfer uh, you know value globally and kind of follow the the steps that I think at the time applications like Venmo and and Square Cash were already uh, kind of uh, trailing right. So. Uh, so we so we did that, and actually the first thing that I did when I joined Circle was to expand that product over to the European region, and so I launched that product um, in those 28, 29 markets, you know, with support for euros and, and pounds. And uh, and one of the things that we were doing at the time was, you know, we, we thought we could use Bitcoin as a settlement layer, right? So every time that uh, there were uh, end users on our platform kind of sending funds across the regions, right, across the US and Europe or across the three currencies that we supported, uh, or even if they were using uh, that, obviously, with Bitcoin itself, we would use Bitcoin as a settlement network. So if you were sending dollars to somebody in Euro, we would, you know, sell those dollars into Bitcoin, use that as a, as a settlement layer, and then transform that into euros on the other end. And I think I think there are still a couple of companies that kind of utilize that method for cross-border settlement. But obviously, after doing that for a while, we realized that there were a lot of issues with with doing that. It was it was actually pretty cumbersome. Um, you know, we we could hedge like exposure to you know vo the volatile asset uh, that that was Bitcoin at the time. Um, you know, we we ended up having a, a trade desk to to kind of perform all of that operation for us. But it just it was it was expensive, you know. While while it, it meant that you could deal with capital in, in a more efficient way, there were a whole a whole host of other problems. And then eventually, we actually removed Bitcoin support from the product. Um, and kind of the evolution that we saw on that, we started we started researching other ways of kind of implementing sort of those features that we wanted to. Uh, we then this imagine that you know circa 2016. With the boom around Ethereum, we actually started researching. All right, maybe we, we need what we need is to build our own token, right? What we need is to build our own settlement token, and we, we we separated a few folks out in the company to kind of go and research that. But I think, but I think <clears throat> quickly after that, uh, we we navigated, um, you know, towards the concept of stable coins. Then and uh, and I think Jeremy Allaire, our CEO, we really owe it to him and and to sort of the vision, right? I think. At the time, Jeremy and others they they made this this proposal internally for us. Why why don't we go ahead and build our own stablecoin? And obviously, as you can imagine, in any company, you know, Circle was still a small company at that point. Um, to kind of you know have this this foresight and imagine, well, you know, let's pause or sort of separate some resources out from the application uh, and and consumer product space that we were focusing on. To go away and kind of build our own infrastructure because we couldn't find the best infrastructure to deliver those settlement use cases we wanted was a bit of a daunting perspective but um but you know that's that's why jeremy is who he is and and so i i was super fortunate to be to be the person on the product team that got separated out right and, and basically my my mandate was um go away and you know build a dollar stable coin because this is going to be super useful for us for settlement use cases and, you know, look at the success uh, that Tether, uh, you know, was already having at that point in circa 2017. Um, and, and so I, I, I went away and, and, and did that and started working with, uh, with engineers to, to, to do that, obviously beginning with researching the space. But I, I always thought that I was going to, you know, 
go away, be separated a bit from the other teams, build a stable coin, and then come back to the consumer products and, you know, reintroduce that as, as sort of a settlement layer in the consumer products. Um, that was, that was what I thought was going to happen. Uh, the, the, the rest is history. We obviously built USCC and, and launched that in 2018. And it was, it was so successful from the get go that, um, that I never had the chance to, uh, to come back and, and build anything else. But I always like to sort of tell that story because I think Circle has, uh, has had a journey into the topic of stable coins that's very different from a lot of journeys that other, other companies have, right? It was, it was that classical, you know, we have, we have some products we would love to see exist uh, and we have tried to build that in certain types of infrastructures um, and now we realize that there's an opportunity to build a better infrastructure and that we never went back to to building those consumer products so that's super interesting i love the the backstory but in terms of uh the i guess the primary mission that you guys have had since day one like would you say that's kind of deviated from your original um, mission that you would have laid out a few years back? Like, w- would you say the primary use case for USDC for you guys going forward is to be used on chain or more so to integrate traditional financial rails, like with things like Visa and MasterCard actually settling payments on chain? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question, Sam. I think I think that that's also, I think, why the DNA of, of Circo and the DNA of USDC is slightly different uh, than, than other stable coins because we have had that perspective when we started uh, thinking about it, right? But obviously, as soon as we started doing, you know, research into, okay, if we're going to build a stable coin, what, what kind of a stable coin is it going to be, right? We started researching algo stable coins, fiat back stable coins, all, all, the, all the options and, and quickly recognized that our forte was going to be around dealing, you know, in this, in this sort of hybrid or, or line that divides crypto and traditional finance, because I think Circle has always played a good role in kind of, you know, connecting the two together. Uh, you know, so the good banking partnerships we have had, you know, the licensing uh, infrastructure that we have had. So leveraging all that made a lot of sense for kind of a fiat collateralized stablecoin. Um, and, we, and we have, as I said, we have had that, you know, super mainstream, you know, like high growth supporting a, a number of uh, a number of users around the world perspective to things but when we started investigating the space we realized wow you know stable coins are are huge right now in crypto capital markets and in fact at that point crypto capital markets were they they had just kind of gone through this switching phase you know from going from uh, being Bitcoin denominated, right? Remember back back then, like you know, pretty much all all pairs, uh, all trading pairs around the world in any crypto exchange, they would be the the major ones would be bound to Bitcoin, right? So you would trade Ethereum against Bitcoin and anything else against Bitcoin, and and all of a sudden there was a transition there, and they all became dollarized, right? And primarily through through the the growth of Tether, everything became dollar denominated, right? And so we 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 saw that as also a huge opportunity to kind of onboard additional users uh, through stable coins into into all those crypto use cases and and we didn't want to you know be be a niche stable coin so we wanted to participate in those markets where things were already where, where product market fit was already found so so we started we started with this dual perspective right when we got to the point of effect, effectively building the product and launching it we, we had this dual perspective we wanted to follow these uh, you know potentially in the future more mainstream use cases we wanted to use stable coins as a way to connect to uh to traditional finance but we didn't want to to let go of of these uh you know segments where there was already product market fit and so we we have always played this dual role and i think i think i think that's part of why ussc had the success that it had as well because then you know we we have seen uh, a fairly quick adoption of ussc in crypto capital markets um sp- especially starting with centralized exchanges and a lot of other crypto applications, but then sort of 2021 when, when you know, the 2020, 21, when the DeFi uh, boom kind of happened, you know, there was a lot of adoption of USC in, in kind of DeFi applications. But we, but the immediate thing that I think also it's, it's worth telling the story, the immediate thing that we focused our attention almost like the minute that we launched USC in 2018, was was this idea of, of APIs right and and uh, and Circo has has brought to market a lot of products that were developer focused uh, and and API driven to allow you know any developer in in finance, in more traditional finance but actually any developer in any application to connect with uh, 
with uh, you know Circle's infrastructure, you know, spin up wallets that could host USCC, um, do on and off ramping from USCC to dollars and back. Um, and and actually, we have had traditionally then a, a, a you know a whole host of customers that utilize USCC for for some of those more either mainstream use cases or or perhaps some use cases where people actually didn't know that they were dealing with USCC. Um, right, the like Dapper Labs, for example, built a lot of infrastructure around uh, wallets and how people could participate in the NFT marketplace. And most of the users did not really know that they were using USCC at all. Uh, and and sort of that was part of the vision that we thought, you know, that we, there is a way for us to uh, like deliver more efficiency in all those use cases uh, through something like USCC. But it was but it was always kind of this dual perspective, and I think we we still continue to have this dual perspective. That's why we have. I think you know good relationship with the Visa and the Mastercards of the world, right? And they they are experimenting with having USCC as this additional and first digital currency on their settlement layer. Uh, it will it will make things so much easier if people instead of uh, you know internally between issuing banks, uh, Visa, um, you know acquiring acquiring banks can uh, instead of be sending dollar wires back and forth, can be sending USCC transactions, right? It just makes it much more efficient. Uh, so I think I think we we always have had this this interest in making sure that we can cover for both. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense, and I appreciate the the background there as well. Uh, and you know, stable coins have really been this killer use case of crypto. It's pretty undeniable to see the growth, especially when you look at things like market cap outs of of some of these stable coins outstanding, uh, namely the fiat back ones like USDC and USDT. Um, but when we look at the distribution of where these stable coins live, right? So what chains that they're on, uh, we see. Circles had this pretty consistent uh, distribution around 80 to 85 percent uh, of, of USDC has been on Ethereum, whereas someone like USDT, you see that migration kind of shifting away from Ethereum and onto Tron. Um, so with the release of the cross-chain transfer protocol, CCTP, um, how do you think about where the most the, the most valuable location for USDC to be uh, distributed on and how how does that how does the chain that it's on help you know increase that spot demand or monetary premium for the asset? Yeah, I think uh, I think we the the the, the evolution of, of multi chain that we have had in the last three years has been super interesting, right? And I think a blockchain like Tron was one of the was one of the earliest blockchains where you could have really really fast settlement and, and you know super super cheap transfers. And so I think. Uh, I think I think it emerged as one of the the contenders, and then and then particularly it's it's very big in Asia in Asian markets in particular, right? It's very popular over there. Um, so I think it was it was a way to kind of facilitate um, first of all like a sort of an intra crypto exchange kind of settlement use case, and then and then I think these days it is actually supporting a lot more mainstream and peer-to-peer and, -peer and dollarization use cases. Again, specifically in Asia, we see that it is very strong in Asia. Uh, USCC also has a pretty pretty major component um, of, of its supply on, on Tron, despite what you said, despite traditionally, you know, 80 or 85 or sometimes even more of the outstanding supply of USCC being on Ethereum. I think I think it's always a journey. It's always an evolution. For example, as I said, what what happened with you know DeFi summer and and everything that happened uh, in DeFi in general has contributed to a lot of that concentration of capital for USDC on Ethereum, right? Um, for and and you know because there's still a, a tremendous amount of capital allocated in in all those those markets. Um, you know, Ave Compound. You look at you look know, look at those blue chips, and they hold so much of of, uh, of USCC deposits from from customers. Um, but then the other thing that we notice as well, I think uh, I think uh, uh, the the safe uh, product from from Gnosis, um, which is a very successful product as a treasury on chain treasury instrument for for businesses, right? Um, I think I think it has. I think the last time that I saw, it had like over four thousand uh, kind of active customers holding USDC on on that product, with with the aggregate uh, deposit like you know being over four billion dollars worth of USDC. So that that just means that all of these companies, um, a lot of them are DAOs, but a lot of them are just you know startups and crypto startups or or startups that perhaps don't see them as crypto but are crypto native in general. Uh, that are also holding their treasury in the form of a non-chain wallet in the form of USCC, which is which is super interesting, right? So those are obviously more of the on the early adopting 
uh, side of, of businesses. But uh, but it's super interesting to see the use cases that they're conducting. There's a lot of you know B two B payments and and payroll use cases there. A lot we see a lot of VCs um, investing in companies and and that first kind of wire payment uh, to the businesses is a USCC transfer. Um, so that that happens primarily on Ethereum, potentially I think because of the the, the how mature those products are, and, and especially because of the security of Ethereum. But then, so that that's also in like an evolution of what we have seen. But then I think more recently, then the world is also changing again, right? So we we see now like a lot of a lot of interest around uh, layer twos and and roll ups on Ethereum, and then. And then, you know, beside besides Tron, which we referred to as, as one of the earlier um, kind of super fast and cheap alternatives in terms of layer ones, we, we have now then seen Solana and Avalanche and, and a lot of those chains that are uh, extremely interesting as well. So we started to see a lot of um, a lot of interest for USC use cases on those. The things the things that are right now are, are extremely interesting for us. Um, and I think particularly comes from from the the strength of the dollar, you know, high interest rates, is uh, is this dollarization use case? Uh, you know, last week I was at ETH Denver. Uh, you know, I heard so many people from uh, Latin America and some other emerging markets talking about how they are holding, how you know, quote unquote, normal people are now holding on to USCC uh, balances and stablecoin balances on a wallet as a way to, you know. Uh, you know, allocate part of their of their uh, capital in something that is not depreciating super fast because of inflation or something like that, um, and and that's that's really interesting to see as well. And that could be that could be one of the other cycles that we see in terms of uh, you know getting crypto to be more adopted um, by mainstream customers. Um, but it as I said, it always comes in phases, right? It always comes being driven by a particular different part of the cycle. So if we take a step back and, and kind of hone in on CCTP, can you can you start by explaining maybe some of the shortcomings of traditional mint and burn architectures with bridges that we see today in crypto and then uh, maybe explain how CCTP actually differs? Yeah, absolutely. So when we so Circle actually I think we we led we led the the way from uh you know with this multi-chain view of the world that we have had. I think we issued USCC on a second chain starting in in 2019, I believe, with uh, with Algorand, and then and then we follow with uh, you know now we're on eight chains, and and soon we might be in 13 chains, you know, because it was our view of the world. We thought that you know these these ecosystems they tend to the way that they work is they tend to be orthogonal in nature. So you know while there might be a little bit of overlap and the same applications being deployed in all these ecosystems multiple times, there's always unique innovation and unique um, customer and, and user growth that happens in those ecosystems. And we wanted to be there. We wanted to be, you know, this digital dollar that's omni-chain and that exists everywhere. And so we started doing that. And then, and then uh, I think starting in 2021, this bridge uh, sort of segment exploded in crypto, right? And all of a sudden it was super easy to connect all these ecosystems together. But then what we started obviously witnessing uh, which was good in many ways because it would mean that you know end users and there was end user demand and so we could almost see where the demand was in these new ecosystems. But we started seeing uh, you know a lot of these bridge solutions um, coming online and um, and the the way that you know traditionally a, a bridge uh, product or or a piece of infrastructure works and and actually it's a lot more. I'll make a a, a very an oversimplification here because these are very, very sophisticated, usually messaging based kind of systems, right? But but at a high level, the way that they work is that you you sort of lock, uh, you know, some sort of crypto asset on the source chain, you know, there's some sort of vault there. Uh, and the locking of that asset on the source chain emits like a message that somebody can trust, uh, you know, by listening to a, a set of relayers or whatever on another chain. And then, and then issue, you know, a synthetic token on the destination chain. This is, this is usually the way that these bridges work, right? And so they are messaging systems, but they involve, uh, you know, locking up assets, um, which, you know, which has been risky in some cases. And we have seen, uh, like some hacks, uh, of, of some of these solutions in some cases. But the other thing that that's, that that approach, um, does is that it, it also, it, it is also what people call path dependent, right? So depending on, which chain you're coming from and which chain you're going to, uh, like the assets need to be locked on the source chain and an asset needs to be issued on the destination chain. If you're coming from a slightly different chain, 
then the assets are locked in a different place. And so, you know, should you not issue a different asset? And so some of these solutions, they are path dependent and they started um, in practice fragmenting liquidity in crypto, right? Because then you would have, uh, I think on, on Solana exempt for, for as an anecdotal uh, thing, because I think a lot of bridges, you know, were connecting to Solana it was really popular. I think we ended up at some point having 11 different synthetic versions of USC, which which was really, really confusing for users, confusing for developers. Right? A lot of people started making these mistakes. And we so so, as I said, circa 2021, we started looking a lot into that and thinking, wow, that's it's interesting what's happening, but it's not great for USCC, right? We don't want liquidity fragmentation. We don't want developer and user confusion. So how, how can we tackle that? We we started to get really close with most of the bridge uh, kind of uh, providers out there, um, you know, thinking about different ways that we could that we could uh, solve for this. I think I think the, the the cool thing about crypto is that people were super super open to have, like have these. Uh, you know, debates and discuss, you know, what, what were better ways to, to address that. But one solution that I think we very quickly got interested in is uh, if, if, if Circo actually played a, a little bit of a bigger role, because USCC is a unique asset, right, in that all of the reserves are offline, they're off chain, right? So whether you have, if you have a dollar in reserve, it doesn't really matter whether you have the, the the digital version of that living on Solana or Ethereum or Avalanche, right? They're they're essentially equivalent, and so if you could destroy one on one chain and recreate one on another chain, provided that you can prove that the reserves are intact, that 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 is something that you can do with an asset like USCC that you cannot do with with other crypto assets, and so and so we started thinking, okay, hold on a second, what if we build some type of infrastructure, some type of component that that every every bridge provider can reuse, um, so that actually when you move USCC from chain A to chain B, you're always going to end up with a fungible version of USCC. You're always going to end up with a native version of USCC. So everybody has the same quality properties, right? You 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 eliminate path dependency, and and almost as a byproduct, as a good byproduct, you also eliminate part of the risk that is involved in these solutions, right? Because if you are destroying USCC on source to recreate it on destination, then you don't have to lock it up anymore. And and USCC, funny enough, it is the most bridged uh, asset in in crypto, just because it's dollars, right? And it's it makes sense to for that to be the asset that you move the most. So we started seeing like all these huge pockets of USCC around all these solutions and and you know some of them were hacked i'm not saying all of them would eventually be hacked but it's just a, a massive massive risk for the ecosystem and so when we realized that we could build that and we got some feedback from you know the ecosystem that that if we built it you know they would be interested in in kind of adopting then then it really made it made it uh easy for us to to go away and and research and, and build that so so as i said cccp stands for cross-chain transfer protocol it's a uh, it's a mix of an on-chain and off-chain solution. Uh, again, the off-chain off part is because, you know, if you're using USCC, the trust model for an asset like USCC already involves you trusting Circle, right? At the end of the day, we manage the reserves. So we thought that it wasn't going to be any detrimental to kind of also have Circle as, as part of the, the, the flow. So the, the way that it happens is that you uh so you send USCC on a source chain to a to a smart contract uh you know that receives that and and kind of register you know the the trigger that somebody wants to move that to a different uh to a different chain um circle has a circle has an attestation service that it runs basically that is monitoring all, all those smart contracts and uh and it can uh, if you come to that service and you ask for a proof that you know a particular transfer has happened on one of those source contracts, Circle can can issue a, a, an attestation saying, "Yep, yeah, we we believe that that transfer has happened and we signed that transfer, we signed that attestation." In such a way that if you bring that attestation then to another chain, to the destination chain, to another smart contract, and you say, "Hey, you know there is a proof here. It was signed by Circle that there was a transfer uh, on this source chain." Then USCC can be reminted uh, on that on that destination chain. So it effectively allows you to almost physically move right USCC from the source chain to the destination chain. That's that's what CCTP uh, allows for. And as I said, the the thing that we have loved is that is that most you know most bridging and, and messaging infrastructures you know. Axelar, Wormhole, Layer Zero, like all of these guys, aggregators, um, 
they're all basically integrating with CCTP and, and USCC will have that experience for, for users of those, of those protocols, of those services, uh, you know, from, from the get go, as soon as we bring it to market. I love the analogy you made there um, with, you know, if you have, let's say USDC on Avalanche and Ethereum, like they are equivalent, but they, they just miss that piece of fungibility, right? You can't actually hold those two assets in the same hand until CCTP. And I also love the idea of like removing the bridge risk by like, you know, when you're and a lot, all these bridges use LPs and, you know, LPs come and deposit liquidity and that's what enables a lot of these transfers. Uh, but this model completely strips that uh, because the USDC would be destroyed on the source chain and minted freshly uh, and newly issued on that on the destination chain. And what's interesting there is is the use of these cross-chain messaging protocols. Um, in, as you mentioned, uh, you know, layer zero, wormhole, Axelar, would Circle ever consider like building out that piece of the of the infrastructure as well? Because ultimately, you know, my, my understanding is that is the piece that delivers the message uh, between the chains. Um, so while Circle actually has the contracts that does the minting and the burning, uh, it's kind of using like a third party technology for the actual communication between those two chains. Yeah, no, at, at least not now, Dan, at least the, the, the perspective and we, you know, we have worked with with these folks for a long time and we, we were very, very careful because we wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, people understood the, the reason why we were, we were building this. I think, uh, I think very early internally, we said, yeah, but we, what are we doing here? Do we want to be in the business of bridging? And I think very quickly we, we said no to that. So, you know, you will not, you will not see a front end. CCP does not have a front end. You know, it's not supposed to be a, a DAP also that can be used directly by consumers. We, we have ha we have had a developer first mindset, you know, for a lot of things that we have been doing for the last two or three years. And so we thought that was also going to be the case here that, you know, we would build actually something that is more of a protocol, um, really focused on collaborating with, uh, with all these, uh, you know, whether they are messaging services, bridge providers, but also aggregators, uh, you know, sometimes even, even wallet providers as well at, at large scale, they want to connect directly with these services. Uh, but the but the point for us is to be like a developer platform that that these folks you know are primarily the the customers of. We we don't we don't see ourselves actually bridging you know building the entire kind of bridge solution and and facing facing counterparties directly. That's that's not the focus that we have. Yeah, I just always marvel at how good of a business you guys have because in a rising interest rate environment in crypto, that's usually pretty bad. But for you guys, it's actually uh, uh, pretty good. So I guess uh, my my question to you would be, um, do you think that you will monetize the issuance of USDC, like uh, going across different chains with fees uh, directly provided to the, the maybe the dApps that are utilizing your services? Or is really the ultimate goal just to grow the USDC to supply so that way you can make more interest revenue on the back end with your, you know, cash and cash equivalents holdings? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great point, Sam. And, and it, it is interesting, right? Because at the same time, Right now, yes, the business is, is a great business. It's a very valuable business. Um, but, uh, but you know, when we launched USC in 2018, interest rates were, were basically zero. So it's, it's interesting to see how, how quickly things change. It's only been five years, right? I think, uh, I think we appreciate that, you know, yes, while, while USC is a super valuable business, um, you know, we, we cannot rely just on, on, you know, net income from reserves. Uh, you know, there has to be, there has to be, um, uh, something, uh, you know, different than that as well. That's why I think we have so much of a focus on, uh, also seeing ourselves as a, as a platform for developers, right? We try to, we try to provide for everything that a developer, particularly in a financial service space, but also, you know, in ad adjacent areas, like gaming, you know, like a lot of other things, I, I share that vision that eventually I think we will see just as we ended up with browsers, web browsers on, on most of the apps that we use on our phones. I think, I think you will have digital wallets on most of the apps that you have on your phone, right? If you just think about the fact that there is a dollar sign and a balance in a lot of apps that people don't think of as wallets, you know, like your, your Uber is a wallet, your Airbnb is a wallet, like, you know, all of these things are wallets and there's no, there's not a lot of reasons there are, we know the reasons, but uh, eventually we think there are going to be good reasons for those to become digital wallets and just be more interoperable with this whole ecosystem. Um, so, 
So I think uh, I think we 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 focus a lot on that. We we want we want that world to to happen. But but when that world happens, you know, hopefully we will be able to monetize other types of services, right? That can be more transactional in nature. To your point, you know, does that mean you know something like CCTP should could have fees in the future? You know, it, it will not have to begin with. It will not have. But you know, I I see a world where you know uh, interest rates you know change in this way or the other. Uh, you know, bridging costs becomes a little bit more standardized or commoditized. You know, I see a world where that could happen, um, but uh, but we don't we don't look only at CCTP for that. I think we, as I said, we have a a broader perspective. You know, yes, interest rates you know make make reserves for USCC valuable today, but uh, but as a business, we have to as as any other business, right? We have to to have a more uh, varied perspective into the future, and and we have a lot of plans for. Additional developer services that we that we are going to build, uh, wallet infrastructures, additional business services, and, and all of those would be monetized in and of itself, but also being supported by by USCC for sure. So, is the use of CCTP permissionless, or if I'm a user or a protocol, would I be interacting directly with those third party providers, those axlars, wormholes, layer zeros? I think as a user, our, our expectation and our recommendation is that. All users would be much better served by going directly to to those kinds of services, right? And uh, and even I think you know there's already a lot of aggregation happening on top of, of bridging, right? And then and then even there's there's there are wallets that connect to those either the bridges directly or the aggregation services, and so you can actually you, you see yourself as more of a, a wallet user, right? Perhaps you don't see yourself as a bridge user. So I I think I think that that will be the case. I think. Uh, you know the, the the smart contracts and the attestation service; those things are permissionless, right? So anybody can use them. Uh, you know, it's it's going to be ab- absolutely um, kind of free for everyone to use. Uh, but I think I think those things are pretty complicated. It is a pretty complicated workflow, even though it sounds simple. You know, steps one, two, and three. You finish those three steps and you get it. But actually, hooking up those steps, you know, it requires a little bit of sophistication. Certainly, some some bit of coding. Um, you know, so I think I think that's why naturally it will be mostly used by developers. And as far as the integration process goes, um, I, I know the original plans were Ethereum first, and then looking into Avalanche and Solana. And I was just curious where the Cosmos ecosystem ecosystem fits into this, right? Because I know DYDX is launching DYDX chain, uh, an app specific chain out in that ecosystem, and they really want to use USDC. Uh, as their base asset for deposits and withdrawals. Um, so, how do you think about bringing USDC into the Cosmos? And um, you know, how has the how has the change in Noble, uh, the general asset issuance chains over there, how has the change in Noble's use of uh, interchain security played a role in that, if at all? Yeah, we we have been we have been super excited about Cosmos as an ecosystem for for years now, and and I I keep I keep talking to folks on the Cosmos ecosystem again. Last week was chatting to some. That um, that you know, it took it took us a lot longer to figure out the best path to to serve that ecosystem than than otherwise. But it's also because I think Cosmos is an ecosystem. It, it it is as as decentralized as it gets. Right there's there's so many different teams, and and you really cannot um, you really have to kind of listen to a lot of those perspectives. Um, and it's so rich in that. But uh, but so to to your to the first part of your question, yes, the plan continues to be we you know the the first route that we have already implemented and we're just finalizing you know security audits and and all that good stuff is connecting Ethereum and Avalanche, um, and so that's the first route that we're going to bring to market. Hopefully, um, you know at some point in the next uh, month or so. Um, and then we 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 would like to follow very quickly with first of all like. You know most of the EVM uh, compatible chains that we have USCC on because that's that's pretty kind of straightforward. Once we have built it on Ethereum, right? It's a little bit easier to deploy on EVM compatible chains. I think outside of those, we we will probably be uh, very soon on Solana as well. But but Cosmos by by all means will be will be the next will be will be uh, you know uh, important. And and by being next, I don't mean you know we will have to wait necessarily. Uh, I hope I hope we can. After a little bit of uh, of time experimenting and and observing the operation of uh, of CCTP on on this initial route, I think we'll try to be quick in terms of covering the other versions of USCC. But yes, then getting to Cosmos, uh, we we will absolutely connect the bridge to to Cosmos. We think it's going to be super important in in the vision that we have for USCC as part of Cosmos. 
um, we have landed we have landed on the, the, this, this design after working with the teams there for many many years that you know there should be sort of this um, um, asset issuance chain to you know it is the term that we have used uh, as well in in many of these discussions you know sort of a neutral uh, kind of app chain right or at least an app chain where its goal is to basically be the port of entry for for assets um, and and in talking to the teams we eventually found this team that also had a similar vision and, and they went away and, and built Noble and you know it's already in, in testnet and, and and hopefully it's going to be be launched on mainnet uh, pretty soon. Um, the vision was you know for for obviously to have that port of entry on cosmos and through IBC you know connect that to basically all the cosmos chains that that's the vision that we have for for how USCC will get to DYDX as an app chain as well. So CCTP will connect. To, to Noble as the port of entry for Cosmos. And from then on, you can IBC it into basically, you know, the entire Cosmos ecosystem where, where IBC is enabled. Um, I think I think we're aligned, you know, between ourselves, Noble, the DYDX team, that that, that is the path. Uh, obviously, uh, obviously we're all we're all interested in connecting CCTP, connecting the bridge to to Noble, to Cosmos, because then because then, you know, Cosmos can have, uh, sorry, DYDX has a pretty interesting upgrade path for their existing users, right? And how to very, very seamlessly kind of move those funds over into the, the new chain and all that. And we are absolutely uh, committed to supporting them. I think I think it's fair to say that one of the key reasons why we have prioritized, uh, you know, bringing new SEC to Cosmos was once we realized and once we learned that, that DYDX was building their own app chain. So that, that, you know, DYDX is a huge, it's a huge use case for USCC. They have always had this huge commitment to USCC and we, we have all the intention to continue to, to support them in, in what they want to build. Um, I, I think the, uh, the interchain security part of what you mentioned, you know, it is a super complicated thing. And I think we, we also didn't want that to, um, to kind of delay you know, the bringing of USCC to Cosmos. So we found a path, you know, we will start with Noble being a proof of authority chain and we, we see an upgrade path into eventually leveraging interchain security. So we're kind of comfortable with, with the roadmap and how it looks. And uh, and as I said, the, the, the main thing is that I, I, I am so excited. I think it's fair to say that, that it is one of the versions of USCC that I'm most excited about and lightening up that, that whole ecosystem and uh, can't wait to, to see that happening in the next couple of months now. Yeah, Cosmos has definitely like been missing a stable coin that's super reliable, that's you know fungible across all of its different chains. So that's super exciting to hear. Uh, when I think about the C CCTP design, I think about IBC and interchain accounts and other applications kind of building on top of the smart contracts you deploy and then kind of making cross-chain transactions more atomic, if you will. So for example, um, a borrowing and lending protocol on Avalanche, but you're a user on Ethereum, you send USDC into that borrowing and lending protocol on Avalanche in order to earn yield. Is that something that you expect to happen? And like, what other use cases are you expecting to come out of CCTP? Yeah, no, absolutely, Sam. I think I think actually it's almost hard to imagine, you know, the the ways that people are going to be able to leverage this. But I think I, I think people, I think organically, I think maybe we wrote this in some uh, marketing material at some point, but but it's uh, it's it's funny that people started to use that term. People started talking about this idea of composable USCC, um, and and it, and it came from you know when we were writing about CCTP and and the fact that all of a sudden. Uh, you know, you actually have a, uh, like a, a, an objective and programmable way to deal with USCC across chain, right? Because of what you said, because I can, I can actually write code that expects a deposit, you know, of USCC from somewhere else. And then I can take action, you know, once I see like particular triggers on a, on a different chain. I, I think the XLR team in particular has a very good vision for this. You know, they have just announced more, more good developer tools, uh, like last week at ETH Denver as well. To just provide developers with this ability to have this, you know, master master dashboard that that is cross chain in nature and and uh, and it you know allows you to observe all these events across chains. I think uh, I think I think what you described, you know, somebody on some sort of a capital market on Cosmos, uh, you know, taking deposits from other chains. I think that's absolutely something that people will be able to do. Um, I think. Uh, 
I think a lot of swapping of, of assets, you know, uh, like if you think about it, the, the evolution of multiple chains has been super, super interesting. But one, one of the not so good things that it causes is the fragmentation of liquidity, right? If I have one asset on one chain, but, but I want to swap that for an asset on a different chain, there is no market today for trading those assets, right? I typically have to combine like a hop to another chain and then hope that the liquidity of that asset on the destination chain is also as good as, as it needs to be and then perform the, the swap on, on one chain, right? But maybe maybe this maybe there is now an opportunity specifically for USCC. And I think it makes sense because the dollars the dollars are the basis of, of a lot of these markets, right? So it makes sense for you to like have a have a hop onto dollars. Uh, but I think it will it will allow developers to hopefully be a lot more creative. You know, there's not going to be as much counterparty risk as before, right? So if you if you trust, as I said, if you're using your SC in a way that you have to trust Circle, you have to trust that at least we are managing the reserves. So hopefully the, you know, the hop to using uh, CCTP, for example, doesn't impact the, you know, the perceived price of your SC due to counterparty risk because, you know, it's 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 most mostly the same. Um, and that allows people to kind of build applications that rely more on that kind of infrastructure. And yeah, I, I think it will be we we that's our whole bet is that by by putting this type of infrastructure in place, it will it will create like another wave of innovation. And I think we already see um, again last week we were having demos of of some developers, you know, showing to us what they can do with with CCCP, and, and it's it's mind blowing. It's really really creative stuff. So. When I think about unlocks from CCTP, I think this is like a huge U potential UX improvement for wallet providers, right? Because, you know, from my wallet, I would love the ability to move funds from, you know, chain A to chain B. And so I've, I'm curious if any wallet providers are kind of like in early talks with you guys and saying like, hey, we'd love to integrate CCTP to simplify the UX of wall wallets. Because, you know, one of the things I, uh, you know, consistently think about is how can we make crypto easier to onboard users into? Yes, yes. We have we have a lot of wallet providers interested in this. We one one I think evolution that we think can happen is that for some of these assets that are essentially omni-chain like USCC, uh, because I, I, I have many multi-chain wallets right where because i do all these tests i know it sounds sounds like a, a sickness or something but uh, but i actually hold ussc in the form of many different chain versions on the same wallet right just to check the user experience and it, and it's kind of not great i have to be honest it's far from great because you end up with multiple dollar balances right so you have you can easily have in some of these wallets three ussc balances right because you have sent them from like different chains i think think about it that now with something like cctp there is an opportunity for you to improve the user experience and say no you have one dollar balance because we support you know at least in, to the extent that they support they connect to all these routes you know it doesn't matter which ussc you send to you know we, we we're going to be holding that version obviously under the hood like that's the asset that you actually have but we can amalgamate those balances, right? Because if you need them to do, let's say you have, you know, 50 USSC on Solana and 100 USSC on Ethereum, but you want to send 125 on Ethereum, right? Um, like there is now the, the chance for you to build a user experience that sort of abstract away all the all the complicated stuff that's happening behind the scenes, and they could, you know, they can bridge it and 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 do something like that. I think I think we have some wallet providers interested in 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 kind of evolving UXs in that in that way. Um, it might take a while. I think the the beginning will probably be you know an evolution of the existing experiences they have. So you know maybe now you can you can you know actually intentionally bridge USCC in this new way through the through the wallet UI. But I think this idea of having a dollar balance that is slightly, you know, more useful, I, I think we'll see that coming. I've got to ask you, um, just because I know Circle and Coinbase have relationships that go back kind of towards the more beginning of, of your guys' inception. So what do you think about Base? Are you excited about it? Have you talked to their team about potential integrations with CCTP on, on Base? Yeah, no, we, we have. Uh, I think Coinbase did a great job with the announcement. I think, uh, I think they, they also did a great job in, in you know, coming to the ecosystem and involving the ecosystem and and uh, and making everybody excited, you know, and we as the issues of USCC, we are we are part of that as well. Um, yeah, we're we're talking we're talking to their team. There's a lot of cool things I think we could do together, but uh, nothing 
nothing yet ready to to announce, but uh, but certainly certainly a, a good collaboration that we're having. Great. Well, Dan, if you don't have any other questions, uh, Jao's already been super generous with his time. So I don't know if you want to share with the audience where they can find you on on Twitter or learn more about Circle. I'll kick it over to you for that. Yeah, sure. No, I'm I'm I, I love Twitter. I'm a big uh, CD Twitter uh, user. I um, you can find me on on Reginato, my last name R E G I N A T T O. Um, and uh, yeah, as I said, we have a, we have a, a strong developer focus. I, I'm always interested in talking to developers, people who are interested in building applications and connecting to USC in some shape or form. If you guys are interested in CCTP as well, I'm 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 your name. You know, please reach out via Twitter or some other channel, and we're happy to talk. Awesome! Thanks so much, Joe. We'll have to do this again.